Well, hello and welcome everyone to this month's conversation. It is going to be centered on nurse education. My name is Jesse, and I will be your host for this event. Excitement here and uh, we're gonna get started in a little bit. My name is Tanika Bruce and I am known as the Network Nurse. We've got a couple of incredible guest speakers today, some of the most inspiring and uh, influential professionals in our field of nursing. And we're going to try to provide you with a lot of information on nurse education. We're going to do that through experiences and thoughts and ideas and then just look at some theoretical and practical training that we do in order to prepare nursing students for their duties as professionals. We'll also take a look at maybe how COVID has given some academic challenges, how it's affected the nursing profession overall, and just its implications during the pandemic. But most importantly, when it's look at the role of nurses and how they are efficient as educators, how they are efficient as teachers, and just make sure that you uh, pick up on some of the teachable moments as we go through and they elaborate just a little bit about how they deal with things in the practical setting, the clinical setting, and the educational setting and how those things can be both opportunistic and also planned. So my name again, Tanika Bruce, I'm in the Tampa, Florida area and we have, we'll let the, the speakers introduce themselves. But we're going to turn it right back over to Jesse. Hopefully we can get our, our mics working, but we're excited to have you all here. Sit back. We've got a great show for you. Okay, so Dr. Holly, uh, we'd love to hear a little bit about who you are, where you're from. Just tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi there, Tanika. Um, I am Tanika's educator, so I did teach classes, and she was my student, and she was also my advisee. Um, I am a doctorally prepared nurse. I graduated from UMass Amherst with a PhD in nursing. I had a very unconventional education. I have a master's degree in nursing, and that's my first professional degree. I received that from Pace University, and um, uh, at the time, there were three schools in the country that provided that kind of degree. So um, very unusual. I've been in nursing education for most of my career in nursing. Um, soon after I became a nurse, I was in the cath lab and became a preceptor. And that started me on my way to nursing education, started my career in New York City at Columbia Presbyterian, moved up to Vermont with my infant twin daughters and uh, spent my career there and um, moved to Florida and started at Nova Southeastern University about two and a half years ago. And as I said, one of my first advisees was Tanika Bruce in the master's program. And then um, recently, I've received a promotion and now I'm the program director for the traditional master's program, which is nursing education, informatics, and also executive nurse leader, which is where Tanika graduated. And I'm the program director for the DMP program, which she currently is a student in, enrolled, and uh, the PhD program in nursing. So thank you. That is awesome. Hi, guys. I am going to jump in here now. My name is Jesse. I am your host for the evening. And it was so wonderful hearing that intro, Dr. Holly. And Tanika, thank you so much for helping me out there. We had some technical difficulties, and I truly appreciate your patience with that. My name is Jesse. I am going to be the background voice guiding you through this discussion tonight. Um, and now we've gotten to hear about Dr. Madison, thank you so much. We love that intro. If we can now bring it over. Do we have Dr. Hume with us still? There she yes. is. Hi. Hi. <laughs> okay. We would love to hear a little bit about you as well. If you can fill us in with your title, position, school, what you're busy doing these days, uh, go ahead and tell us all about you. So I am Dr. Therese Hume. I am a a DNP, which is a doctorate of nursing practice, which I um, obtained from Case University in Ohio. I'm also a family nurse practitioner. 
board certified. And so I started my nursing career in uh, 1986. I had my two-year degree from Hillsborough Community College. And then I went on um, to University of Tampa in the 80s and got my bachelor's degree. I went up to Florida State to Tallahassee and um, obtained my master's there as a family nurse practitioner in 2000. And um, I loved having preceptees. So I started out as a preceptor. That's how my education career started. And then I really loved it. So I decided to go back for my doctorate degree. Although my doctorate degree is in practice, um, I uh, have a, a minor in um, nursing education. So currently I work at South University in the master's program. I teach the students at the very beginning when they first start. And then I have the pleasure of having them again right before they graduate and move on for board. So I get to help them prepare for, um, for their next phase in their career. And I just love it. That is amazing. Well, we are so, so fortunate to have both of you here tonight spending your precious time away from work, spending it here with us to benefit from your education and from your experience. And as Tanika mentioned, this is going to be a really special conversation tonight, um, really centering on nurse education and kind of diving into the life lessons, thoughts, concerns, fears, the things that you guys have been dealing with and understanding throughout the course of your uh, time and experience in this world. So we, before we really dive into all of that, I just want to do a really quick comment to our guests and say the people that are viewing this that are going to be benefiting from you guys tonight, chip in, talk a little bit in the chat, tell us who you are, where you're checking in from so that we have the benefit of seeing you here too. If you have any questions that come up during the course of the conversation, feel free to leave that in the chat and we will do our very best to get to those towards the end of the discussion. But just know that if you're a viewer here tonight, you are part of this conversation and we're so happy to have you here. But again, so, so thrilled that Tanika, thank you for taking the time to manage to bring to you these amazing, amazing doctors for our benefit to sit and listen to. Um, we're going to do just a conversational style. We're going to bounce through a couple of different questions that I'm sure all of us are very interested in. I've had a, the pleasure of getting to research them beforehand, so I get to know even more about you guys, which is very, very exciting for me. So let's go ahead and start with Dr. Hume. If you can just tell us you know, your first semester as a clinical instructor, what what really stood out to you? Why why did you decide to be an educator? What was something that really was a funny moment or an embarrassing moment or something that you really recall from that first time as a clinical instructor? So I can tell you that um, I had taught um, some um, continuing education credits and um, in an ICU course in the hospital. And that did not prepare me for what an educator really does. And so for one thing, I really wanted, um, this is towards the end of my career, I'm in my early 60s. So I really wanted to give back to the um, nursing community, just really some of the, um, some of the things that I've learned over my um, 30 plus years in nursing. Mm -hmm. And there's really no other way, I think, to educate another, another nurse unless you have been there and done that and seen that and done that. And so then you can explain that to them in that way. And so I was um, totally blindsided, let me say, by the complexity of teaching. I thought I was just gonna get up there and lecture and do my thing and that was it. Well, there's a lot of preparation to just one class. Right. And let me tell you the first one, the first class I taught, an embarrassing moment, is that A, the technology is crazy, but <laughs> I'm lecturing and lecturing and lecturing and lecturing, right? And um, I get done with my lecture and the student said, 
Um, Dr. Hume, you didn't have your slides up. Oh, no. <laughs> so here I am lecturing away for 45 minutes. Nobody said um, not one thing to me. Dr. Hume, we, we see, we, you know, we're, you're talking and we don't see that your PowerPoints. I'm pointing to the slides <laughs> like Vanna White and they're not seeing anything. So that wow. was my first day class teaching. So that was a <laughs> teachable moment for me to always look at the screen and make sure there's something on it. Very true. And I'm sure everybody's heard through Zoom, all these Zoom courses this year about yes. people hacking and putting different things up on their uh, yes. screen. So <laughs> I, I think you were, let's say, lucky that at least it was nothing. <laughs> yeah, true, true. Well, <laughs> Well, that is wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. It's so nice to hear that you're human too. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All that experience and you're also human. That's wonderful. I love it. <laughs> well, Dr. Madison, thank you for also being here tonight. And I know that you have had such a storied career as a nurse. I, If you could boil it down, what is the most important lesson that you have learned during the course of being a nurse? or about being a nurse, sorry. <laughs> well, I would think that it's um, about that we always have to learn, that we can never become complacent. And I just wanted to mention, it was a busy day, it was a busy week for me. Um, and um, I just went online a few minutes ago and I saw that Time Magazine said Person of the Year is all the healthcare professionals um, that have fought, you know, for COVID. And um, I just like to recognize all of my healthcare professional colleagues and my nurse colleagues and um, thank them for their service. So thank you all. That is so beautiful. I hadn't heard that yet. And that is so deep that that is what they decided to go with this year. L let me just piggyback on that, if you don't mind, Dr. Madison, me keeping you on the spotlight for a second. Um, what COVID-19 induced academic challenges have affected non-clinical education, specifically nurse leaders? Has there, has it, how has it affected you personally? Well, I, I have a vantage point actually, um, because the programs that I oversee are online. So didn't really affect me, but it affected my colleagues enormously. So I have that little bit of perspective from that. Um, you know, we have at Nova Southeastern University, we have, you know, fabulous pre-licensure programs. So they were affected, as you can imagine. And then I have, um, we have um, a APRN programs. So those were conducted in a hybrid fashion and those people were seeking clinical. We have family nurse practitioners, acute care nurse practitioners and psych nurse practitioner students. So they were all affected with, with access to healthcare. And um, one of the joys that I have is uh, with the PhD program, I have students all over the country. And in fact, I actually have a student now in Taiwan. And so I talk to everybody about what's going on. A lot of our students in the PhD program are educators. And I found out like in South Bend, Indiana, they never closed the hospitals. Um, our, our hospitals in Southern Florida, they closed. So students did not have access to um, clinical experiences. And um, that, you know, it's been nine months of not much access to clinical experiences for students. So that's been really, really difficult. Um, you know, other places in the country acted differently. So it's great to have that ability to learn. So yes, I, I was a, actually, you know, someone who got to view everything and um, maybe provide some support for my colleagues that were making that transition to more of a virtual learning environment from a face-to-face -face environment. Right, right. Wow. Um, Dr. Hume, if I can ask the same question of you, what is your perspective? 
Well, from a, a clinical perspective, um, being in the family nurse practitioner program, it has been extremely difficult. So even in the bachelor's program, um, like Dr. Holly said, the uh, hospitals closed down the um, access for the nursing students, the BSNs. And so what happened with um, uh, master's students the, in the family nurse practitioner program is that they had an extremely difficult time getting preceptors. And so you have to have 500 hours of face-to-face -face time with a preceptor in order to sit for boards for certification to be an APRN or a, a nurse practitioner. And, you know, there's um, various, you know, nurse practitioners, but the bottom line is that, that I do the FNP program. And so what happened was, is that we, like um, Dr. Holly said, went to a hybrid. So our um, school at South has um, 720 hours of clinical time built into our curriculum. And what happened is, is we um, decreased that down and put in simulation and case studies so that people could still move on. And there were several people, several students that couldn't find preceptors at all and ended up having to take an incomplete or sit out for a quarter because the offices didn't want students in because they didn't want the liability of, you know, the student maybe possibly catching COVID or the student bringing COVID into the um, facilities. So it has been very, very challenging. And over the last couple of months, they had tried to open up things again. I mean, even, um, but, you know, now they're starting to tighten down a little bit, but even you have to, uh, as a nurse practitioner, you have to sit for board certification. Even Prometrics, who does the board certification, a lot of their staff in the Tampa area got the COVID. So mm -hmm. there weren't places for nurse practitioners to take their board exams. People from students from Tampa went all the way to Jacksonville to take their boards and even farther just to take take their board exams. Wow. So it's been difficult. Well, you know, that's interesting. It kind of ties into another question I had for you about how much different the experiences are for the students now versus what they used to be. And I'm sure that COVID experience is one very striking difference, but your road was a bit different even in a non-COVID year from the students that you prepare now. So tell us a little bit about that and how those differences are important to look at now. Well, I think that for, for one thing, um, back when I started in 1994, um, you had to be, you had to have 10 years of um, ICU or 10 years of ER experience. So you couldn't go back and just, um, you know, um, and just be a nurse practitioner. And so I think that that is um, one of the things that's lacking. You can see that in the experience because now you can go right from your bachelor's degree in some programs to your DNP. And so the clinical hours that you are spending are few. And so, and to my, my opinion is that, that um, you need to have a certain amount of um, time as a, a BSN nurse at the bedside or practicing before you become a, a master's prepared nurse, if you're gonna be doing clinical practice. Because clinical practice is, um, is recognition. And so, you know, in one of the past, um, I think it was Dr. Cole in one of the past shows, she was talking about Benner's um, novice to expert. And even though that you're, uh, you're an expert at your field of ICU and, and you've been there maybe 10 years, when you start your master's program, you're new. You don't know how to diagnose and treat, you might know what some diseases look like because you've ran, run into them as a, um, and seen them as a, a as a bedside nurse, but um, you need that clinical experience. And so that's one of my concerns about the COVID issue is that the nurse practitioner students aren't able to see 
like they're not able to see what um, the disease processes that they're going to see every day look like. How how um, how might you treat this person different than this person because of the circumstances that they're in? And then just on top of that, that you know the the patients themselves are in so many different circumstances that it's a a disadvantage right now to not have that clinical time. Right. Right. Wow, that's so heavy because you really think about all the you I mean, as a lay person, I don't think about all the intricacies. I think about the the science and the you know technique of it all, but you don't think of the one-on-one -on -one personal interaction that you pick up from having time with a person, a person-to-person -person communication and learning from that, just that element that is going to be missing for so many of these students. It's it's such a heavy burden for them to try to play catch up once yeah. they get into the field. So wow. Dr. Madison, let me let me bring keep on this uh, <laughs> little bit of a COVID role here. You just stepped into this very big role and then all of a sudden here comes COVID-19. Um, but tell us a little bit about your role, what your school, how how you've adapted your educational journey with all the regulations in the academia setting and for students? Well, um, one of the things I need to do is I need to keep um, our students going forward as far as doing their research, especially the doctoral students. So um, we've had to make some adjustments. Um, you know, they thought they were gonna interview people face to face or do surveys. And, um, you know, they thought that they would have tons of participants for their research study and um, have not found that to be true. So we just have to be really um, good listeners, good problem solvers and, um, trying to be very positive and supportive of our, of our students because um, they are working nurses. So it's not like they're, you know, they've got nothing to do but just education. Um, and so they have, you know, demands whether they are in practice or they are in nursing education themselves. And they have to make all these changes to how they deliver their content so we really are, um, you know, trying to be really supportive and listening to students and so that they can tell us, you know, that's part of my role. I, I think of myself, um, I don't know if Tanika will agree, but certainly to be a mentor and um, to be very supportive of uh, nurses as they engage in their graduate degree, whether it's a master's degree or a doctoral degree. So that's one thing that we've changed uh, as far as COVID has gone. Uh, for the, the degree um, in the master's, they are expected to do um, a clinical time. And um, so we've come up with alternate assignments. Not as good, maybe. Preceptor's not as good. For nursing education, we were very fortunate um, because our our own nurse educators, you know, the pre-licensure faculty have stepped forward and um, have these wonderful um, students. They precept the students in a virtual world. Hopefully, when they graduate, they'll be able to meet them, you know, face to face for the first time. But um, they've served as, you know, their preceptors, their virtual preceptors come to virtual classes and, wow. and help in that manner. So that's another way that we've made some adjustments, um, you know, for, for certain students. That, you know, and that's such a great segue as well, because I know Tanika, you are in the midst of the, all of this as well. How has it affected you as a student? from the other side of the spectrum here. Right, right. Thanks for asking. Uh, well, I think, um, like Dr. Holly said, the biggest thing is, believe it or not, just being a cheerleader and really just encouraging uh, not only ourselves, but other people. I think the biggest part of uh, what's going on right now is just reminding one another to do self-care because 
before mm -hmm. it was like like she said we thought we were going to do certain things you know we thought okay well in this doctoral program we were going to be partnering with uh, you know the administration to uh, solve certain problems within the hospital or investigate certain things in order to make real change and then here comes COVID and you know, it doesn't matter from the CEO to the uh, IT no matter what area it is, if you're a nurse, you officially become COVID screener, you know, or right. just a hands-on. And so that's a big change for not only the people that are supposed to be precepting. I mean, my preceptor, you know, as we speak, uh, went to doing, you know, for hospital COVID, you know, back and forth ICU. So it changed the scope a lot. And I think the biggest thing is just reminding ourselves that self-care through all of it, because the mental health portion of it and again like she says just encouraging us to continue to go on because it is a difficult thing like who wants to, to research when when all, so many things are going on so uh, in that respect I think uh, that's the biggest change of it especially because nurses are the, the worst patients we take care of ourselves last and uh, our focus is generally on the, our patient population. So we're, we're just kind of like that dive in. And when those things are changed, it's very difficult sometimes to focus on your own self and your research. Right, right. You know, that, that also leads to a great thought process. I want to bring this over to Dr. Hume. I want to talk a little bit about the limitations on these practice settings. Um, when you're identifying these teachable moments, enabling learning to take place in the practice setting, most of, most of this can be both opportunistic and planned. Could you provide a few tips that other educators could do in order to create more teachable moments, regardless of whether or not the practice setting has had its limitations? So I think that, um, you know, in this learning environment and, you know, we're all um, virtual. So I think that one thing to remember is that um, you don't want to give them death by PowerPoint when you're mm -hmm. doing a virtual and you have to you have to cut them some slack about the, the kids in the background and the noise in the background because they're 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 home too. The kids are home. There has just been really like some some things that we have had to adjust as instructors too and cut some slack to them. And I think that for other instructors, what's really good is if you can, because of the fact that they have all this sometimes chaos going on, they don't always pay attention to you like if they were in class sitting right in front of you. Right. So I I put up some YouTube videos that they can reference later. So I put up my slides so that um, they can reference later. I put up some um, references that they can look up later that's going to maybe cement it in a, a little bit better. And um, we um, were able, luckily, this um, past quarter to be able to come in and, and do some skills. So um, so we brought the students in just 10 students at a time and were able to, um, to you know, teach them some hands-on skills. So we, you know, learn a, um, in the very last class, we learn how to suture, we learn a little bit about chest x-rays. And so um, hopefully, you know, we can a little bit at a time, bring them back a little bit at a time. But mm -hmm. I think the main thing is that you just really have to, to um, realize the difficulty not only is on us, but it's on those students that are also at home trying to pay attention and keep their kids and their dogs quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And you know, just listening to both of you talk, even before we went live, just both of you have such passion about education. And I just want to ask this question to both of you. And since we're on Dr. Hume right now, I'm going to keep it with you just for a moment. If you can just talk about what got you started about this path of education, what got you so passionate about it? So what got me so passionate about it was when I was precepting, I can't tell you how many students that I had said, why don't you teach full time? Why don't you teach full time? Why don't you teach full time? 
Mm-hmm. And so I thought, why don't I teach full time? For one thing, I, I was in my 50s and I didn't want to go back to school at 50 something to get a doctorate degree. Mm-hmm. That was one of the things <laughs> that was holding me up. And then at Case, they have a intensive program where I just went up one week a, a, a semester. So that was perfect for me. You learn everything, you go seven days a week, and that's the way I did my doctorate degree. But mm-hmm. when um, you're with students and they get it, and when you show them something and they understand it, and then when you, as a nurse practitioner, as a um, preceptor, you um, let them go in to see the patient themselves first, and then they come out and they tell you, you know, what's going on with the patient. And when they tell you everything perfectly, you're like, yes, they got it. <laughs> they got it. And, you know, we're not going to live forever, right? We're going to retire. So we got to we gotta pass on this knowledge so that this next generation of nursing can, can be awesome. Yeah, yeah. And what about you, Dr. Madison? Um, so... It's, it's funny, Dr. Hume and I both started our educational journey as preceptors, um, and that was, you know, really exciting to see people. Um, I, I remember the first person I precepted, I was in the cath lab, and um, she had come from the CCU, and she was a very experienced CCU nurse, so I, I had learned a little bit under her, and now the role was reversed. It was just really wonderful um, and exciting to see. So yes, I decided that education would be um, a very rewarding career and I, I really have loved it. I um, My undergrad degree is in psychology and I was interested in how people learn. So I think it was just, there was always a seed of that for me. Um, but it's just been so rewarding knowing, you know, seeing the success of your students. It's, it's there's nothing quite like that. Right. Yeah. And now you're a program director. So how do you have to look through a different lens now to make sure that education across all those programs maintain that same level of excellence as when you were teaching courses? Yeah, that that's really, that's really hard. Sometimes um, I, I, I taught a course this semester in the doctoral program and um, really enjoyed it, but don't know, um, don't know if it's the best use of my time right this minute. Um, one of the things I love to do is uh, to be the chair of a student, either their um, project for the DMP or their dissertation for the PhD. Um, that's a, that you develop a really close relationship and um, that's very, very satisfying. But yes, I have, I have quite a few chickens, so to speak, (laughs) that I have to, you know, worry about and, and, you know, especially at this time and you're right, you know, they have children and they, you know, I just, my hat's off to them just juggling so many different things right now. Just really a testimony to the strength of nurses. Right, right. I love that. And, you know, along the line of the strength of nurses, I'm going to pass it back over to Dr. Hume. And you, you, nurse education often gets the least reward, but nurse education educators are often the most fulfilled nursing professionals. How is that possible? Well, like Dr. Holly said, that, that when you see the success of the students, then you feel that that's your success also. Um, I, like I said, I, had, I teach the very last class before they take their board certification exams. And when they text me and they say, thank you for your help for this past two years, I passed my boards, like my heart just jumps along with theirs. Mm-hmm. And so proud of them. That's beautiful. And now the trend is shifting back to family nurse practitioners within the next couple of years. How can you inspire current practitioners to become educators right now, especially with the focus being so heavily on the frontline workers? That That is um, honestly very difficult because um, the 
the, the salary generally for educators is less than you're going to make in practice. It is um, really something that you have to have a heart and a passion for is to teach. But when um, you kind of know in your career when the time is right. So those that precept for several years, they kind of know that, okay, I want to maybe teach a class. And so you start as an adjunct. And then you take, you know, you teach one class and see how that goes. And then they might ask you to teach another class and then you see how that goes. So you can, you know, you can step into the role as an educator while you're working in full time practice. Um, so, you know, you can go, especially with so many classes being virtual that um, you can step into that online role as an instructor and start your education that way, just to kind of get your feet wet, see how it goes. Right, right. Um, Do and now we're, we're getting close to the end of this conversation. We don't want to hold you guys up for too long. And again, thank you so much for spending your time with us this evening. Um, to wrap it up, I want to ask a couple more questions though. Dr. Madison, what can you say are the unwavering things that we must do in educating our new and young nurses and practitioners? Well, I think that we have to be role models. And um, Tanika talked about one thing that I am passionate about is self-care. I do practice yoga every single day. Mm -hmm. If it's just for 10 minutes, I do it. Um, so caring for themselves. I went to a, a presentation by one of my colleagues and she says, you know, if there's no gas in the tank, the car doesn't run. So it is the same with, with nurses. So that's really important. You have to, so I think if, if I said one thing, you have to be a role model. You have to be a role model of um, behavior for self-care. You have to be a role model, being positive, um, being creative, um, you know, just being really supportive of your students. Uh, we say that you know caring is the basis of nursing, and if we don't distribute, you know, um, model caring behavior to our students, then we shouldn't be educators, and we we could not expect them to have caring behaviors to others. So I think role modeling is the most important thing we can do. Also in role modeling, having intellectual curiosity, wanting to do research, doing research, um, you know, contributing to the profession through papers and presentations, all those things you need to be a role model. Love it. And I see Dr. Hume smiling and nodding along as you're talking. Obviously, you are in agreement. Dr. Hume, is there anything else you would like to add to that before we close out for the night? No, I think that she said, you know, pretty much at all that we need to be a role model and we do need to um, have self-care. I have my students write a schedule out every quarter so that they can see how busy their life is going to be with clinicals, class. And then I say, OK, where's your time? Where's right. where's your me time? You have to put it in because if you don't schedule it in, it's not going to happen. Right, right. Well, honestly, from the bottom of all of our hearts, thank you so much for your insights. There was so much good information in here, and it's so helpful for everybody to be reminded of if they you know, are in the trenches right now or if they are in the both of the positions as leaders and as educators, but also as students. It's so beautiful to hear all of that tonight and even more beautiful to see all of your. I love that everybody is in this beautiful, harmonious holiday spirit with all of your uh, hats and trees and fireplaces. And it's making me all warm and cozy. So we wish you all the very happiest of holidays. Thank you all so much again for spending this evening with us. And Tanika, would you like to close us out for the night? I just want to say I uh, totally agree with Dr. Holly and Dr. Hume about the role models, but I'm not so sure about the writing papers. <laughs> so <laughs> I have to throw that out there. She writes beautifully. <laughs> So uh, we just would thank all of you all for um, attending our live chat 
And most importantly, we thank our speakers. They've done a wonderful job. And uh, we couldn't have picked better people as role models and educators. And just we've been blessed today to be able to learn their stories and just a lot about nursing education that many of us uh, have, have asked and maybe scared to, to look at and see. And as I've seen some of the questions in the chat, you know, why do educators uh, kind of get the short end of the stick? And I think after tonight, we'll get an opportunity to look at it through a different lens. So thank you, everybody, for attending. And uh, we'll see Thank you, you next for having time. us. Thank you. Thank it's you. Been a pleasure. So we're going to give out some freebies to our uh, live event guest people that registered. We'll give you a ten percent discount to Nurse Network Store, also our certificate. So if you didn't register, it's not too late. You're welcome to do that. We'll also make sure that you will put our replay up. So if you didn't get a chance to catch it live, we have it up on our YouTube channel. Feel free to go back and watch it as many times. And make sure you click the subscribe button. It's a little red button and bell there, so make sure you do that as well. And we'll also give you a freebie to download. Last but not least, make sure that you follow us and understand that we've got a new book coming out. It's uh, called The Path Back, and it's about workplace injury and workers' comp. So stay tuned for that, especially if you're in healthcare. We appreciate you guys being here, and we look forward to seeing you on the next live chat. So make sure you check out our social media, and we will have all of that for you. Thanks again.